Hello everyone and welcome to another lecture video for Unit 6 on Energy, Resources and Consumption. This video, combined with the next video, are going to cover a lot of our options in terms of renewable energy. Thus far, talking about fossil fuels and nuclear energy, we've been talking about non-renewable energy. So today and in the next video, we'll talk about the different types of renewable energy, how they work, the pros and cons, and how we're going to use them to save the planet. So um, we're going to go through a bunch of options. The first one is getting energy from biomass or biofuels. And this could be as simple as burning wood. Uh, biomass, uh, if you take a look at this map here, uh, you can see a different um, uh, uh, amounts of biomass produced in different areas of the United States. So you can see the red and purple areas are producing a lot of biomass per year, whereas the gray or yellow areas are producing very low biomass per year. And this can include things like wood, charcoal, uh, animal products or manure, leftover crops um, or, or plant remains, uh, even waste or trash can be burned, and as well as things like biofuels, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, the advantages of using biomass are many. First of all, it's pretty cheap, and you're producing not only energy, but also heat. So you can heat your home and produce energy to, say, cook food uh, at the same time, and it doesn't cost very much. It's very easy to access, doesn't really require any refining. You can just chop down a tree and start burning. It grows back pretty quickly uh, compared to things like fossil fuels. It replenishes at a much faster rate. You know, you can grow a bunch of hay in one growing season. Uh, trees take a little bit longer than that, of course. Uh, you can get energy from biomass that you otherwise wouldn't be able to eat. You know, you grow a corn uh, crop and you pick the corn and eat the corn. What about all the stock that's left over, like this part? Uh, you can cut that down and burn it. Uh, the disadvantages, however, though, is first of all, it produces carbon dioxide. It also produces other uh, air pollutants like carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, and volatile organic compounds. These are all things we'll talk about in more detail in the next unit, but it can produce a lot of uh, air pollution. It's harmful to breathe. And, of course, if you're over-harvesting trees, it could lead to de deforestation, something we talked about at length in the last unit. Uh, that being said, the CO2 that is released when you're burning uh, plants or biomass is quote-unquote better than the CO2 that you release when you burn fossil fuels. And this has to do with the fact that the, the carbon that is in fossil fuels has been stored underground for hundreds of millions of years and is not participating in the carbon cycle, right? Modern carbon versus fossilized carbon. So modern carbon, uh, the stuff that we've, we're burning when we burn uh, trees, right? There is not really actually a, a net increase in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere because Trees or even things like, especially things like grasses and, and weeds and corn and stuff like that, those grow pretty quickly. Um, and so the carbon that we're burning when we burn, say, a corn plant is, was actually only very recently yet in the atmosphere. So the cycling is happening a lot faster. Whereas with fossilized carbon, uh, that has been stored underground for millions of years and is otherwise not participating in the cycle. So ultimately, it means that burning biomass, while it does produce carbon dioxide, uh, it's actually relatively carbon neutral. Uh, and uh, something else I mentioned is something called biofuel, which is when you make fuel like gasoline, except you're doing it out of biomass. Um, you can do this in a couple of ways. L many landfills uh, where you put a bunch of um, organic waste, perhaps, like compost, uh, will have bacteria in it that will digest the, the waste. And as you do that, uh, it can produce gas like methane, um, which you can then capture and you can uh, use for energy. Here's another diagram of a landfill where it's got the trash in it, and it's got a, a liner to prevent seepage and into the uh, aquifer. It's probably made of clay. Uh, and then as it um, gets anaerobically digested by bacteria, uh, methane gas is released by the bacteria, and you can actually capture that and sell it. Uh, you could also make biodiesel, uh, which in the United States, most of the biodiesel is made from soybean oil with a number, a uh, significant amount coming from a variety of other sources. And if we look at the biodiesel consumption uh, in the United States over the past decade or so, we can see that it's gone up substantially. Uh, so moving towards biodiesel and away from regular diesel is definitely an improvement. Uh, the U.S. is the world leader right now in terms of the consumption of biodiesel. So that's great. Uh, additionally, we can make ethanol from corn. Ethanol, or known as alcohol, um, can be uh, mixed with gasoline to make it a, a little bit less uh, polluting in terms of what it's, uh, the pollutants it's putting into the atmosphere. And we can also make oil from, from algae, which is really cool. I'll show a video on that in class. 
So ethanol can be burned as fuel. You, you can generate this from corn or from sugar cane, um, and it doesn't produce any additional CO2 via combustion, uh, again, because we're using more modern carbon as opposed to if we were using just pure gasoline, it would be fossilized carbon that we've extracted and, and refined from petroleum. Um, but the, the energy return on investment for ethanol is extremely low, so the profitability is somewhat in question. Um, you know, it takes about one and a half liters of ethanol uh, to equal about one liters of regular gasoline. So it's about a, a, a three to two ratio there. Um, but what oftentimes what we'll do is we'll blend the ethanol with gasoline. So if you go to the gas pumps, you can see sometimes that uh, the gas you're buying on leaded contains up to 10% alcohol. Depends on the state or the gas pump that you're at. Um, but take a look for that next time you go to fill her up. Uh, and like I said, this, again, I just really want to drive this home. If you're burning ethanol, it's producing CO2, but then quickly that CO2 will be captured by wheat or corn, and then it will be harvested and turned back into bioethanol and then burned again. So the CO2 is cycling very quickly through as opposed to uh, reintroducing carbon that has long been stored underground. Uh, here's an interesting map looking at uh, ethanol and electric fueling stations in the United States. Ethanol is yellow, electric is blue. Uh, and another type of, of biofuel I mentioned is from algae. This is so cool. I really think we should be investing in this. Um, basically what they do is they grow algae in pools. The algae is going, produces an oil as it grows and you can then refine that into fuel. Uh, and the, the benefits are numerous. Um, look at this cool, so cool, such a cool photo, such a pretty green. Uh, the benefits are numerous. First of all, algae is absorbing CO2, it's producing oxygen, and it's filtering the water. Uh, it's totally harmless if you spill it. It's biodegradable, so you can compost it if the facility shuts down or something. Again, it's not adding any new carbon into the atmosphere. And um, compared to ethanol, like corn ethanol, algae fuel yields between 10 and 100 times more fuel per unit area. I mean, you can grow in pools, so you can, you can do it pretty much anywhere where you're willing to set up a facility. Um, it doesn't need to have nice uh, arable land that you can grow a farm on because it's a, it's a pool of algae. So you can really set it up in the desert, I suppose. Uh, from the Department of Agri uh, Energy in the United States, if algae fuel replaced all petroleum fuel in the United States, it would require 15,000 square miles, which is only 0.42% of the U.S. map, or about half the size of Maine. Uh, this is one, less than one-seventh of the area of corn harvested in the United States in 2000. So, in theory, <laughs> right, we could replace all the petroleum fuel with algae fuel using a very, very small amount of land. Um, so, I'm really big on the algae biofuel. That's the way of the future. Um, a second option, instead of using biomass or biofuels, we can use solar energy. And this is becoming more and more prominent in... Um, American society, the panels are becoming more efficient, they're becoming cheaper, more accessible to the every, everyday American. Um, and a couple different types of solar energy though. There's the panels, these are what we call photovoltaic cells, photo meaning light, voltage meaning electricity. Uh, they make electricity from the sun's energy. There's also solar thermal, which uses the sun's energy to capture heat. And then there's passive solar, um, which I will show some diagrams of. Uh, that's the sun, in case you didn't know. So photovoltaic solar cells are probably what you think of when you think of solar panels or solar energy. And what they do is they are capturing energy from the sun and transforming that into electrical energy. They're often set up in massive solar farms out in the desert, but they can also be found on many rooftops uh, around the country. Uh, how do they do it? Well, basically they've got a special semiconductor material in the panels, oftentimes it's silicon, and the Sunlight will excite the electrons in that panel, and those electrons will start to move, and when electrons move, that's electricity. So it generates a very low voltage electric current. Um, the benefits are uh, pretty substantial. No emissions of CO2 or any type of pollutant at all during operation. Uh, they can produce electricity during peak demand uh, in the summer when it's hot and people want to use their air conditioner. The sun is also out, so these solar panels are going to be very productive. Uh, and also, they're economically feasible. Once you set them up, they're pretty low maintenance, and they can pay themselves back in anywhere from 5 to 20 years. The drawbacks, however, uh, are also uh, numerous and can't be overlooked. 
Uh, first of all, they're expensive to manufacture and install, although I will say they are getting cheaper at an exponential rate, which is great. Um, their use is uh, limited by whether or not the sun's out, right? So if it's a cloudy day, you're going to get less energy. If it's night, it's not going to work. If it's covered by snow, you're going to have to clean that off. Um, manufacturing the panels requires energy and water and uh, oftentimes rare metals. Um, that need to be mined for, and even the, the manufacturing of the panels can release toxic metals and gases. Um, and large solar farms like these can fragment uh, desert ecosystems. Um, although they are deserts, they are still thriving um, ecological communities, and, and we, we are fragmenting them. Um, that being said, if we covered 4% of the world's desert areas with photovoltaics, we could supply all of the world's daily electricity use. Now, is this realistic? No, but it does show you the capacity um, for uh, solar power as well as um, you know the impact that it could have on the desert. Only 4% of the world's desert. Um, if we covered this part of the United States with solar panels, um, we could meet all of the United States electricity needs. Um, that would be about 3 billion solar panels at $250 each, $767 billion. Uh, and in, in 2015, the U.S. spent about $3.8 trillion. So to do this plan, if we were to actually do this, would be about 20% of the expenditure for the year, uh, but then we wouldn't have to spend any money on, on fossil fuel subsidies or anything like that. Uh, again, not realistic, but an interesting thought experiment to take a look at how this could work. A uh, really cool case study of solar canals in India. They've got these water canals used for supplying water for irrigation and drinking, and they've put a bunch of solar panels atop them. Uh, and it, not only are they sharing space, so they're reducing the footprint of the area that they need to produce electricity and harvest their water, but they're also uh, protecting the water from the sunlight and reducing evaporative losses of water. Uh, it cost $18.3 million to set this up and is expected to pay itself back in 13 years. Uh, it's been about six years since they set it up. Uh, and it's been widely successful. Uh, really, really cool example of innovative technology um, and, and having two things work together synergistically. Another type of active um, solar energy is called solar thermal, where you basically you put a bunch of pipes on your roof and water runs through these pipes. And as it runs through, it gets heated by the sun. Uh, so you don't have to use electricity to heat your water. You can use the sun to do that. Uh, so like I said, the, the water flows underneath this um, Usually they're black because they have a lower albedo and absorb that sunlight, these pipes. It will absorb the heat and then it goes and distributes that heat throughout your house to taps or a boiler or, you know, um, the electric kettle or whatever. Solar thermal energy can also be used to generate electricity. Uh, if you've got a bunch of like parabolic mirrors and you have a pipe run through those mirrors, the mirrors will reflect the sunlight and direct it at the pipe. So as the water flows through that pipe, it will get heated up extremely uh, hot. And then uh, eventually it can uh, generate into steam, and then we use that steam to turn a turbine and generate electricity. There's also passive solar heating. This is like you set it up and you walk away. Uh, could be kind of fun, like solar ovens, um, but these are actually used in many places around the world to cook food. Um, but it could also be in terms of the architecture. Uh, having lots of windows facing the right directions can heat and cool your home. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, we want southern, southern facing window, windows. Uh, because in the wintertime, if we look uh, in the wintertime, the northern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. So if we have windows that are facing the south, facing this direction, they will be pointed towards the sun in the winter. And then in the summertime, uh, if we have windows that are facing south, they'll be pointed away from the sun. So what that means is in the, in the wintertime, the sun will be angled into the windows to, heal, to heat our homes. And in the wintertime, uh, or, sorry, I might have misspoke. I need to slow down. In the wintertime, the sun will be angled into the windows to heat our homes. And in the summertime, it will, not, it will be angled such that it won't even be able to hit into the window. So it will keep our houses cool. Um, also, having windows on either side can help cross breezes and, and airflow. So um, a lot of great opportunities there for solar, uh, passive solar heating. Um, this is a map looking at solar resources in the United States. Unsurprisingly, the desert in the southwest is going to be the area for highest solar potential. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, and the last option I'm going to talk about in this video is geothermal energy. Uh, geothermal energy. Geo means earth, therm means heat. Uh, so geothermal energy is capitalizing on the energy from the earth's core. Uh, there is radioactive decay uh, in the earth's core of elements, uh, uh, of various elements. As they decay, uh, as they release radiation, that will produce a lot of heat and create magma. 
Due to convection, as the magma heats up, it will rise. And as it rises, it will actually heat groundwater that's in the crust. And that groundwater, as it gets hotter, will turn to steam because it evaporates, which we can then harvest uh, for heat or for electricity generation. Uh, we see a lot of geothermal in the United States, China, Kenya, and Iceland. So in Iceland, what they do is uh, they use direct heating, where they're capturing that steam from the groundwater and they're using that to directly heat their homes right into the radiator. So they're not converting the steam into electricity, they're just using the steam to heat their homes. Uh, about 90% of Iceland is heated this way, which is pretty wild. Um, a lot of geothermal plants in the United States uh, use the steam to generate electricity, where that steam just like we've seen before, steam turns a turbine which spins a generator. So we've got magma heating the groundwater that um, if there's a natural crack in the, in the ground that can produce a geyser, but otherwise the steam that's being produced in the groundwater uh, can be tapped into with a well and then used to turn a turbine or a generator and then that steam is cooled and condensed and it falls down as rain or can be injected back into the aquifer to maintain water pressure. Um, and then there's actually a third method, which I think is pretty cool uh, as well. This is um, another really cool thing I stumbled across, uh, where basically, uh, in order to understand this, you need to know that once you go like six feet underground or so, the temperature is about 60 degrees year-round. doesn't matter where you are in the world, about six feet underground, it's... Um, about 60 degrees. So if you run some pipes deep under, or not super deep, but uh, underneath your house, uh, in the summertime, you can have the water pump through those. And, and as the water is pumping through deep underground, 60 degrees is cooler than the average summer temperature. So that, so that water will actually cool off as it flows through the cool soil. And uh, then that cold water can be ejected back into your house to cool the air. Um, the opposite will happen in the winter. 60 degrees underground is warmer than the average winter temperature, so as cold water flows underground, it will start to warm up, and then you can use that to heat your home. Uh, so it's a pretty cool method of uh, capitalizing on, on geothermal energy. The advantages of geothermal, no combustion means no greenhouse gas emissions, and it's totally renewable because it um, is, has to do with the radioactive decay of Earth's crust, uh, or of Earth's core. The disadvantages, however, are that uh, you can only build a geothermal plant where there's geothermal activity. You can't just build one wherever you want. There has to be a geothermal activity underneath. Um, and those patterns are going to shift over time, over hundreds, thousands, millions of years, but they will shift. So a plant that is up and running today may not be able to run a thousand years from now. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, and you have to set up the plant, which has a high initial cost. Uh, all power plants cost a lot to set up, but because geothermal is not as frequently used as something like coal, the infrastructure isn't quite there in comparison, so it's a little bit more expensive. And the process can release, release hydrogen sulfide gas, although it's, it's usually in very small quantities and is easily contained and, and um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, chemically transformed so it's no longer dangerous. And here's a map showing the distribution of geothermal resources. So we see, oh, a lot of geothermal out west, not much on the east. We can't probably build many geothermal plants over here because of that. Uh, so that's it for this first video. We will continue talking about um, renewable energy in the next one, and I will see you then.